The Short Lives of the Dominican Saints Part 4 February 28th Blessed Valana de Botti Died 1360 Valana was a member of the noble family de Botti and was born in Florence. Her childhood was spent in acts of astonishing devotion and in the exercise of austerities, such as are rarely practiced even by persons advanced in age and virtue. She ardently desired to embrace the religious life, but, over-persuaded by her parents, she at length consented to marry, and her nuptials were celebrated with the utmost magnificence. Possibly her early piety may have had in it some tinge of pride, which necessarily led to a fall. Be this as it may, immediately on her marriage she abandoned all her exercises of prayer and penance, and gave herself up to a life of heartless and sinful dissipation. How long this lasted we are not told, but God, who had better chosen her for himself, at length recalled her to better things in a wonderful manner. One night Valana was preparing for an entertainment of unwanted splendor. She was dressed with all the sumptuous extravagance of the times. Jewels sparkled in her hair, on her arms, on her very shoes. Before leaving her room, she went to cast one parting glance at the mirror, but, instead of the dazzling image of her own beauty, a horrible spectacle met her eyes. God had permitted her that the deformity of the soul within should become visible on the outward person. Her hair, bound with gold and jeweled chains, she beheld transformed into a mass of coiled and venomous serpents. Her face her fair face was darkened into that of a hideous negro. Her eyes were red and fiery, and, instead of her beautiful mouth and ivory teeth, there grinned the open jaws of a monster of hell. Then Bellana's heart opened to know where and whence she had fallen. She tore the jewels from her hair and left her palace, not for the gay entertainment that awaited her, but for the neighboring church of, of the Dominicans, where, flinging herself at the feet of a holy friar, she made, amidst tears of contrition, the confession of her life. She returned home to enter upon a rigorous course of penance, which continued until her death. To atone for her past vanity, and to honor the poverty of her divine master, she thenceforth wore only poor and shabby garments, and she divided her time between exercises of prayer and austerity, and the care of the indigent. She earnestly desired to retire to a hermitage. Her confessor, however, would not permit her to do this, but he gave her the habit of the third order. Trampling underfoot all human respect, she wished to go from door to door begging alms for her beloved poor, but she only relinquished this intention in obedience to the will of her husband. She had thoroughly realized the presence of our Lord in the person of his poor. And this truth was yet more vividly brought home to her by a miraculous incident. One day, as she was returning from church, she found a poor sick beggar lying in a miserable condition in the street. Taking him in her arms, and gathering superhuman strength from her charity, Valania carried him to one of the public hospitals and laid him on a bed whilst she went to seek the necessary remedies. On her return, the bed was empty, and the most careful inquiries failed to discover any traces of the sick beggar, who was always believed to have been our divine Lord himself. 
On one occasion, when she had a fierce encounter with the devil, St. Catherine the martyr appeared to her in a beautiful crown in her hand, saying, Be constant, my daughter, and behold the magnificent reward that awaits thee in heaven. This vision was regarded by Valanya as a presage of her approaching death. From that time her sufferings in miladies increased, and with them her thirst to endure yet more for the beloved of her soul. No, Lord, she once exclaimed when she felt better, I do not ask for any alleviation of my sufferings, but rather that they may be increased. Having received the last sacraments with great devotion, she begged to have the Passion of our Lord read to her, and the words, bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. She placidly expired. 1360 When the sisters of the Third Order prepared the body for burial, it became resplendent with beauty, and emitted such dazzling rays of light that they could not fix their eyes upon it. To satisfy the devotion of the people, it was left unburied for the space of thirty-seven days, and was still perfectly incorrupt when laid in the tomb. Valanya appeared after her death to some holy women who were spending the night in prayer, and, in answer to their inquiries, she said, Call me no longer Valanya. Now that I am in heaven, I am called Margaret or the Pearl. She was beatified by Leo XII in 1829. Thursday after Sexagesima Sunday Translation of the Relics of St. Catherine of Siena this festival was originally established under the name of the Commemoration of St. Catherine of Siena, or Feast of Her Spousals, to perpetuate the memory of the mysterious favor conferred upon her in the year 1367, when the saint had attained the age of twenty. The city of Siena was given up to the riotous festivity usual at the close of the carnival. And Catherine had shut herself up in her cell, seeking by prayer and fasting to make reparation for the offenses committed by the thoughtless crowds who passed her door. Then our Lord appeared to her, and addressed her in these words, Because thou hast forsaken all the vanities of the world, and set thy love upon me, because thou hast, for my sake, rather chosen to afflict thy body with fasting than to eat flesh with others, especially at this time, when all others that dwell around thee, yea, and those who dwell in the same house with thee, are banqueting and making good cheer. Therefore I am determined this day to keep a solemn feast with thee, and with great joy and pomp to espouse thy soul to me in faith. As he was yet speaking, there appeared in the same place the most glorious Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the beloved disciple of St. John the Evangelist, St. Paul the Apostle, and the great patriarch and founder of her order, St. Dominic. And after these came the kingly prophet and poet, David, with a musical psaltery in his hand, on which he played a melody of ineffable sweetness. Then our blessed lady came to Catherine and took her hand, which she held towards her divine son, and besought him that he would vouchsafe to espouse her to himself in faith, to which he consented with a very sweet and loving countenance and, taking out a ring that was set about in four precious pearls, and had, in the other part, a marvellous rich diamond, he put the same on the finger of her right hand, saying thus, Behold, I here espouse thee to me, thy Maker and Saviour, 
in faith, which shall continue in thee from this time forward, evermore unchanged, until the time shall come of a blissful consummation in the joys of heaven. Now then, act courageously. Thou art armed with faith, and shall triumph over all thy enemies. The vision disappeared, but the ring, invisible indeed to other eyes than Catherine's, remained upon her finger, a mysterious token of the love of her divine spouse. We are expressly told that this event took place on the last day of the carnival, which in Siena was the Tuesday after Sexagesima. But, following the more general custom, the feast which commemorates it has always been kept on the Thursday. This feast was raised to a higher rank and its name changed to that of the translation of the relics of St. Catherine in the year 1866. The Holy Virgin of Siena died in Rome, 1380, and was first interred in the cemetery adjoining the church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, but later on the sacred remains were removed by the master of the order, Blessed Raymond of Capua, formerly her confessor, to a stone sarcophagus on the right-hand side of the high altar of the church. When he had done this, he remembered what St. Catherine had predicted to him on the eve of St. Francis. When they were together at Vorain, on their journey back from Avignon, namely that he should have that same day in a future year caused such a translation of her body to be made. Blessed Raymond afterwards detached the head from the body and sent it to the convent of San Domenico at Siena, where it was at first carefully concealed, as the holy relic could not be exposed to public veneration before the saint had been raised to the altars of the church. Subsequently, however, probably in the year 1385, Father Raymond had made known to the consistory of the Republic in what manner the head of their beloved fellow citizen had been brought into their midst, and it was resolved that a grand festival should be celebrated and a solemn procession made to receive the sacred relic, as though it had been but newly brought to the city. The most touching feature in this celebration, of which minute accounts have been preserved to us, was the presence of the saint's aged mother, Lapa, who walked in the ranks of the sisters of the Third Order, close behind the canopy, beneath which was borne the head of her beloved child. It would be tedious to speak of the various relics which at different periods have been detached from the holy body and bestowed on various convents of the order, of the translation of the sacred remains to the rosary chapel made by St. Antoninus when prior of the Minerva, and of yet a third translation at the time of St. Catherine's canonization. A fourth and last translation took place in our own times. On 17th of April, 1855, when the church of the Minerva was undergoing restoration, the saint's sarcophagus was again opened by Father Alexander Vincent Jandel, general of the order, on which occasion a considerable portion of the sacred relics was taken out and sent by his most reverend paternity to St. Dominic's convent, Stone, the mother house of the English congregation of sisters of penance, which bear the name of St. Catherine. On August 4th of the same year, the restoration of the Minerva having been completed, Pius the Ninth of holy and happy memory, consecrated the high altar with his own hands, and the remains of the Virgin Saint of Siena, after having been carried in solemn procession through the streets of the Eternal City, were, a few days later, 
laid to rest beneath the same high altar, where they still repose. March 1st. Blessed Christopher of Milan, Confessor. 1484. Blessed Christopher was one of the apostolic men who flourished in the order in the 15th century. He belonged to the great convent of St. Eustigorius at Milan, and was distinguished for his spirit of prayer and penance, and for a remarkable gift of prophecy, of which many instances occur in his life. He preached with great success in various parts of Italy, especially in western Lombardy. In the year 1460, he exercised his apostolic functions with such success at Tagia, a town on the Riviera, not far from San Remo, that the inhabitants determined to build a convent for the friars, in the hope of retaining Father Christopher in their midst. The building was raised on a site whereon the holy man is said to have seen the Holy Ghost ascending in the form of a dove, a happy augury of the graces and blessings which God intended to shower down on the future community. In the same place Blessed Christopher also built a large chapel in honor of our Blessed Lady, which, in obedience to her command, was dedicated under the title of Our Lady of Mercy. The servant of God governed this new convent for several years, and drew to the order many excellent subjects whom he carefully trained in the way of religious perfection. He had an especial zeal for the due celebration of the divine office, and ordained that the father appointed to discharge the office of Hibdonadarius, whose duty it was to preside at the divine office and to sing conventual, conventual mass, should, after the example of the priests who served in the temple of old, not be allowed to go out, but during his week of office be occupied solely in the divine worship and in the work of his own sanctification, remaining in solitude with God on behalf of his brethren, who were employed in other offices. He also regulated the studies of the religious, causing them to devote themselves to the assiduous reading of Holy Scripture, and of the fathers, especially of the angelic doctor. Blessed Christopher has left many writings, chiefly sermons, which are preserved to this day as most useful for religious, especially for preachers. The holy man lived to an advanced age, laboring indefatigably on the glory of God and the salvation of souls. He was seized with his death illness whilst preaching the Lent in the little town of Pigna. He immediately caused himself to be carried back to his beloved convent of Tagia, where he received the holy sacraments with utmost devotion, and singing and praying, gave up his soul to God, surrounded by his weeping brethren. His blessed death took place in the year 1484. Many miracles were worked at, at his tomb, and the devotion to him has been uninterrupted even to our own days. He was beatified by Pius the Ninth. March 2. Blessed Henry Suso, Confessor. 1300 to 1365. Henry Suso was a German by birth, and at the age of thirteen took the habit of the Dominican convent at Constance. He showed but little fervor during his novitiate, and lived in negligence and dissipation till he had completed his eighteenth year. But the divine wisdom, whose devoted disciple he was destined to become, 
was pleased to touch his heart. One day, as he sat at table in the refectory, he heard read aloud some passages from the Book of Wisdom, which produced a powerful effect on his soul. He began to undertake a thorough change of life, but was beset by grievous temptations, all of which he generously and preservingly overcame. For two and twenty years he practiced the most terrific austerities. During eight years he wore on his shoulder a cross studded with sharp nails. Twice every day he disciplined himself to blood. Night and day he wore a hair shirt armed with one hundred and fifty sharp iron points. And in addition to these mortifications he observed extraordinary abstinence, enduring in particular the most extremity of thirst. Nevertheless, when he had come to his fortieth year, it was revealed to him that, after all these sufferings, he had only reached the first degree of true mortification, and that, if he would attain the perfect love of God, he must consent to pass through far more searching trials. He had to endure the most cruel cal calumnies, frightful interior desolation, the loss of friends and of reputation, and a thousand other crosses. Yet in the midst of all these afflictions, which were exquisitely painful to a sensitive heart, he never lost confidence or courage. Blessed Henry Suso bore a tender devotion to the holy name of Jesus. He engraved it with a sharp penknife over his heart, and found in that adorable name a buckler of defense against the assaults of his enemies. This devotion to the holy name was widely diffused among his spiritual children, many of whom used to wear a small scapular on which were embroidered the letters I.H.S. His love for our Blessed Lady was one of the tenderest and most childlike description. During the Christmas season he always deprived himself of a portion of the fruit served at table, offering it in spirit to her and praying her to give it to her divine child, for whose sake he went without it. As soon as the first flowers appeared in spring, he hastened to weave a garland, which he placed on the head of Mary's statue in the Lady Chapel, in the hope that, as she was the fairest of all flowers and the bliss of summer to his heart, he would not disdain to accept these first flowers from her servant. He had many devotional practices in honor of his heavenly mother, and she sometimes deigned to show herself to him in vision. Full of zeal for the salvation of souls, Blessed Henry labored constantly in the ministry of the Word, and was one of the most renowned preachers and spiritual directors of his day. He was endowed with a sublime gift of prayer, and the numerous spiritual works which he composed won for him in his own time the title of Ecstatic Doctor. The best known of his writings is his little book of eternal wisdom, which treats chiefly of the passion of our Lord. Blessed Henry passed to a better life in the convent of Ulm in Germany on 25th January 1365. From the time of his death he was beatified by the voice of the people, and Pope Gregory the Sixteenth approved of the veneration which had been paid to him from time immemorial and gave permission for his office to be celebrated throughout the Dominican order. March 6th Blessed Jordan of Pisa, Confessor, died 1311. Blessed Jordan of Pisa, called also Jordan of Rivalto, was born in Italy in the latter half of the 13th century. After studying humanities at Paris, he took the habit of the Dominican order at Pisa in 1280. 
Having completed his novitiate, he pursued his study at the universities of Bologna in Paris, and became a distinguished lector, teaching with great success in, in some of the most important convents of the order. Blessed Jordan's learning was said to excel that of all other fathers in his province put together. Besides being an eminent philosopher and theologian, he had studied Greek and Hebrew, and was gifted with so prodigious a memory that he is reported to have known by heart the breviary and the missal, the greater part of the Bible, and a large portion of the Summa of St. Thomas. But his renown as a saintly religious and as an apostolic preacher far exceeded even his reputation for learning. Following the new custom just then coming into vogue, he used to preach in Italian instead of Latin, and the fragments of his sermons which have come down to us are regarded as models of pure and beautiful diction. The Italian language was that time was as yet unformed. The eruptions of the northern nations had corrupted the dialect spoken in various parts of the peninsula, and there might be said to be no vocabulary of purely Italian words. In spite of these difficulties, Jordan succeeded in forming for himself a beautiful system of language, and we are expressly told that these words he used were intelligible to all. These words in no way differ from those now in use. Whence Blessed Jordan is justly entitled to the honor of being amongst the first to give its present fixed and beautiful form to the Tuscan tongue. The holy man exercised his apostolic ministry in many cities of Italy, and probably also in Germany. But Florence was the chief scene of his labors, and his popularity there was unbounded. He sometimes preached as often as five times on the same day, and to the same audience, who never wearied of listening to his words. As the churches were too small to contain the crowds who flocked to hear him, he frequently delivered his discourses in the public squares. Italy, at the close of the thirteenth century, was a prey to terrible dissensions and to the deadly feuds of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. But by dint of prayer and preaching, Blessed Jordan succeeded in extinguishing all animosity for a time in Florence, and in establishing peace between the rival factions. The city was completely transformed. The women laid aside their luxurious apparel, sinners abandoned their vices, and gave themselves fervently to the practice of virtue. And the holy man was able to say with regard to his penitence, I know many who are prepared to sacrifice their property, and even life itself, rather than commit a mortal sin. His success at Pisa was equally great, and a confraternity in honor of our divine Saviour established by him in that city, subsists even to our own day. His style of preaching was eloquent but simple, and adapted to the capacity of his audience, and his sermons were interspersed with anecdotes, usually drawn from Holy Scripture. His confidence in God and in the efficacy of prayer knew no bounds, Preaching one day on the conditions which should accompany prayer, he exclaimed, If you pray thus, I swear to you by Christ, by the holy scriptures, by all the saints, and by my own soul, that you will obtain whatever you ask, for heaven and earth would sooner perish than that your prayer should go unheard. Blessed Jordan had a filial devotion to our Blessed Lady. The old chronicle records that it was always he who began her office in the dormitory, and did so with a voice so loud and clear and fervent 
as to animate his brethren to similar piety. One day a beautiful vision was granted to him as he sat at table in the refractory. He beheld the Queen of Heaven, escorted by two princesses of paradise, and by a multitude of angels, bringing food to the brethren and serving them with their own hands. The name of his holy father St. Dominic was constantly on his lips, and he lost no opportunity of celebrating his praises in the pulpit. In the midst of all his success, the servant of God ever preserved profound humility of heart, and had a horror of all earthly honors and dignities. His superiors, however, were anxious that he should take his doctor's degree, and in obedience to their commands he accordingly set out for Paris. But on arriving at Piacenza, he fell sick and piously departed to our Lord on the 19th of August, 1311, being assisted on his deathbed by the Master General and other members of his order. When the sad news reached Pisa, the principal inhabitants at once set out for Piacenza to bring back the sacred remains, which were met outside the city by a vast concourse of people, weeping and mourning over the loss of their beloved fellow-citizen. Many miraculous favors were granted through his intercession, and the walls of the Dominican church, in which he was interred, became covered with pictures and ex votos, bearing witness to his power with God. Pope Gregory the Sixteenth approved the veneration which, for upwards of five centuries, has been rendered to Blessed Jordan, and gave permission for the annual celebration of his festival throughout the Dominican Order and in the Diocese of Pisa. March 7th. St. Thomas Aquinas, confessor, doctor of the church, and patron of Catholic schools. 1225-1274. St. Thomas was born of noble parents about the year 1225, in the fortress of Rocca Secca, in the south of Italy. To the neighboring little town of Aquino, he owed his surname of Aquinas. When he was quite a child, a terrific thunderstorm burst over the castle, and his nurse and little sister were struck dead in the very chamber in which Thomas slept on unharmed. This circumstance accounts for the great fear of thunder and lightning which the saint is said to have had throughout his life, which caused him often to take refuge in the church during a thunderstorm, even le leaning his head against the tabernacle, so as to place himself as closely as possible under the protection of our Lord. Hence the popular devotion to him as patron against thunderstorms and sudden death. The words Ave Maria were the first which his baby lips were heard to utter, and, long before he could read, to place a book in his hands was discovered to be an unfailing means of drying his tears in all his childish troubles. When only five years old, his education was begun by the monks of the celebrated Benedictine Abbey at Monte Cassino, and by the time he had reached his eleventh year he had made such progress that his parents sent him under the care of a tutor to the newly founded University of Naples. The Dominican church in that city became one of his favorite resorts, and whilst still quite a boy, he asked and obtained the habit of the order. As the saint and his religious brethren believed his family to be extremely averse to the step he had taken, he was hurried off to Rome, whence it was intended to remove him to Paris. But on the way thither he was waylaid by his brothers, two young officers in the service of the emperor, and sent back to his angry parents at Rocca Secca. Here he was imprisoned in one of the towers of the castle, where he had to suffer cold, hunger, and every sort of privation. 
Worse than this, his brothers even went to went so far as to introduce a woman of evil life into his chamber. But with a frame, flaming brand snatched from the hearth, the saint drove the miserable creature from his presence. With the same brand he then traced a cross upon the wall, and, casting himself upon his knees before it, besought to God to grant him the gift of perpetual chastity. As he prayed, he fell into an ecstasy, during which two angels appeared and girded him with miraculous cord, while at the same time assuring him that his petition had been granted. In memory of this event a confraternity was established in the sixteenth century called the Angelic Warfare, to obtain through the intercession of St. Thomas the virtue of chastity. This confraternity still flourishes. Discovering that his constancy was not to be overcome by persecution, his disappointed relatives at length connived at his escape, and he was let down from the tower in a basket to the friars whom by appointment were waiting below. They carried off their rescued treasure to Naples, where he was immediately admitted to profession. Thence he was sent to Cologne, where he became the disciple of Blessed Albert the Great, the renowned Dominican professor of the day. The humble saint at first succeeded in concealing his extraordinary talents from the knowledge of his brethren, but when at length they were accidentally discovered, the delighted master exclaimed, We call Brother Thomas the dumb ox, but I tell you one day he will one day make his bellowing heard to the uttermost parts of the earth. Blessed Albert and his saintly pupil afterward taught together with immense applause, first at Paris and subsequently at Cologne. He was in the university of the former city that St. Thomas took his degrees, first as bachelor and afterward as doctor of, in theology. On both of these occasions he had as his companion his beloved friend, the great Franciscan theologian, St. Bonaventure. St. Thomas commented on the works of Aristotle, and, having purged the texts of the, of the pagan philosopher from everything that was opposed to the truths of faith, established a complete system of Christian philosophy. Amongst his many works we may mention his Summa Against the Gentiles, his treatises on the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Creed, and, most important of all, his Summa of Theology, which, however, he did not live to complete. It was at his earnest entreaty that the Pope Urban the Fourth extended the celebration of the festival of Corpus Christi, already kept in Germany and the Low Countries, to the Universal Church. The saint wrote the office for the feast, and was the author of those hymns to the Blessed Sacrament which we are all familiar from their use in processions and at benediction. He also composed the Adoro Te and the Anima Christi, Soul of Christ, Sanctify Me, etc., which was a favorite prayer with St. Ignatius. On one occasion our Lord spoke to him from a crucifix, saying, Thou hast written well of me, Thomas. Re what reward wilt thou have? To which the saint replied, No other than thyself, O Lord. St. Thomas had not yet completed his fiftieth year, when, worn out by his labors in preaching and teaching, he breathed his last at the Benedictine Abbey of Fossa Nova on his way to attend the General Council of Lyons. His death took place on the 7th of March, 1274. He was canonized in 1323 by John the Twenty-Second. 
in 1567, St. Pius V confirmed on him the doctor of the church, and in 1880 Leo XIII declared him the patron of all Catholic universities, academies, colleges, and schools. Humility was ever the characteristic virtue of this great servant of God, and from his humility sprang his extreme modesty in the expression of his opinion. Though raised so high above the others by his gigantic intellectual powers, St. Thomas was the sweetest and most charitable of masters and of fathers, always ready to stoop to the capacity of the youngest and dullest of his scholars. No matter how important the affair might be on which he was engaged, his cell was always opened to his brethren whenever they wished to speak to him, and he would cheerfully turn from the most absorbing occupation to give them his undivided attention. Most touching and beautiful is the account left us of his manner of spending his time and of means he adopted for sanctifying the ordinary actions of the day by devotional practices. But the limited space at our disposal in this short biography compels us to conclude. We can but mention one out of many of his remarkable sayings, such as the anth answer given by him to his sister when she asked him what she must do to become a saint. Vele, he replied, which means will it. March 10th. Blessed Peter de Jeremia, Confessor, 1381-1452. Blessed Peter was born of noble parents in the city of Palermo, in Sicily, and gave early signs, not only of surpassing genius, but of much devotion and sanctity. He went through his studies with great distinction in the University of Bologna, and was about to take his degree as doctor in law, when an extraordinary circumstance turned his thoughts from worldly honors, and led him to consecrate himself wholly to God. One night, as he was studying in his chamber, which was on the third story, he was startled by loud and repeated knocks at the window. Summoning up all his courage, he inquired who his supernatural visitor might be. I am such a one, was the reply, thy relative. After having taken my doctor's degree I was called to the bar, where, as thou knowest, I discharged my duties with much distinction and success. Blind and miserable wretch! I spent all my time in defending others, and I undertook very unjust causes in order to obtain for myself honor and wealth, contrary to the dictates of my conscience. Alas! I found none to plead my cause before the terrible judgment seat of God, and I am condemned to everlasting torments. But before the ministers of the divine justice cast me into hell, I have been sent to give thee this warning. Flee from the tribunals of men, if thou wouldst faint, be acquitted before the judgment seat of God. Then, with a despairing howl, the terrible visitor departed. Peter instantly formed the resolution of consecrating himself entirely to the service of God, there and then took a vow of perpetual chastity. When morning dawned, he went to a locksmith and procured an iron chain of fourteen pounds weight, with which he girded himself, passing it three times around his waist and riveting it by a plate of copper. During the remaining fifty-one years of his life, this terrible instrument of penis was never laid aside, and, when his body was prepared for burial, it was found deeply embedded in the flesh. After earnest prayer that he might be directed in his choice of the religious order in which he should devote himself to the divine service, he entered the Dominican noviceship at Bologna in 1400. 
After completion of his studies, Blessed Peter became a distinguished preacher and exercised his apostolic ministry all over Italy. So numer numerous were the conver conversions wrought by his sermons that St. Vincent Ferrer, when visiting Bologna, asked to see him, embraced him affectionately, and exhorted him to persevere in his blessed work, to which he was visibly called by God. The holy man took an active part in the general council of Florence, held under the pontificate of Eugenius the Fourth, for the reunion of the Greek and Latin churches. All the fathers of the council were in admiration at his zeal for the faith, his profound learning, and the cogency of his arguments, and the Pope sought to manifest his appreciation of his services by raising him to high ecclesiastical dignities. All these holy, the holy man steadfastly declined. He was, however, compelled to accept the office of apostolic visitor in Sicily, though out of humility he begged that his powers might be limited to the restoration of regular observance among religious, and especially his own order. His labors in this difficult and delicate work were singularly blessed. He not only re-established strict discipline in the convents, many of which had fallen into relaxation during the great schism of the West, but became the apostle of the island. The fruits of his preaching in Palermo were so abundant that the churches were too small to contain the crowds who flocked to hear him, and he was often obliged to deliver his sermons in the public square or in the open country. In reward for his zeal, God frequently worked miracles, enabling his voice to be heard to a distance of upwards half a league. Blessed Peter's attraction was to the contemplative life, and he spent great part of his days and nights in prayer and in the practice of the severest austerities, similar to those of the ancient fathers of the desert. Many miracles were, were recorded to have been worked by this faithful servant of God. When he was prior of the convent of Palermo, the procurator one day came to tell him that there were no provisions in the convent. Blessed Peter immediately set out for a place on the seashore two miles from the city to beg an alms of the fishermen, for he knew that great quantities of tunny fish were being caught at the time. The fishermen drove him away with abuse, ru rudely refusing to let him have a single fish. The holy man answered nothing, but, returning to his little boat, directed his course back to Palermo. The shoals of fish were enclosed alive in great stake nets, but as soon as Blessed Peter left the shore, they all left out of their prisons and swam in a vast body after his boat, as though determined not to remain the prey of these churlish men though willing to be taken by him. The dismayed fishermen then hurried after the man of God and besought his pardon. The holy prior made the sign of the cross, whereupon the fishes obediently returned to his nets, and, having received the assistance he required, blessed Peter went back to his convent. When his term of office as prior was ended, he was made master of novices, and set himself with the utmost vigilance and fervor to train the young souls committed to his charge. It pleased the Divine Majesty to perfect his servant by subjecting him to many grievous bodily infirmities, which he looked upon in the light of heavenly, of heavenly favors. When allowed some respite from his sufferings, he would lovingly complain of it to God, and, being once asked why he grieved at the cessation of his pains, he replied, 
because when I am not in pain, it seems to me that God is withdrawing his hand from me. As he lay on his deathbed, he began to recite the one-twentieth psalm, and on coming to the last verse, May the Lord preserve thy going in and thy coming out from henceforth, now, and evermore. He repeated the words three times, and then happily departed to our Lord on March 7, 1452. He was beatified by Pius VI in 1784. March 18th Blessed Sibylina Biscossi Virgin, 1287 to 1367. Sibylina Biscassi was born in Pavia, in Italy, of devout and respectable parents, in 1287, and from her infancy was noted for her spirit of piety and prayer. She was left an orphan at an early age, and when she was only twelve years old a severe illness entirely deprived her of sight. Some charitable sisters of the Third Order of St. Dominic took charge of the afflicted child and clothed her in their habit. Her blindness was a heavy trial to Sibylina, and for many months she earnestly besought the Holy Patriarch, who had adopted her as his child, to obtain for her from God restoration of her sight. When at length St. Dominic's feast came round, she confidently hoped to obtain the grant of her petition. But the day wore on, and still her prayer remained unanswered. At length the saint appeared to her, and, taking her by the hand, led her on a mysterious journey. Their road at first lay through the midst of narrow and darksome places, the sight of which filled Sibylina's soul with horror. Then her heavenly guide conducted her through the regions of unutterable beauty, all flooded with celestial light. We are not told whether or no the Holy Patriarch spoke to Sibyl, Sibylina, on this occasion, but on returning to herself she no longer felt the slightest wish to be cured of her blindness, which she understood to be figured by the first part of her vision and which she trusted would be the means of bringing her to the enjoyment of never-ending happiness. Accepting with her whole heart the cross which had been laid upon her, she now began to devote herself with greater fervor than ever to the divine service, and specially to meditation on the Passion. When she was sufficiently instructed in the exercises of the spiritual life, she left the community of tertiaries to which she had hitherto belonged, and began at the age of fifteen to lead the life of a recluse in a little cell adjoining the church of the friar's preachers, where she spent the remaining sixty-four years of her earthly pilgrimage, leaving it only twice during the whole of this period, and then under obedience. For seven years she practiced the most terrific austerities, which she was at length obliged in some degree to moderate. Then God made known to her the secrets of contemplation and of interior mortification of the will, which are of higher value than any bodily exercises. She was favored with many heavenly visions and revelations. Penetrated with a lively devotion to the Holy Ghost, she always prepared with the utmost fervor for the Feast of Pentecost, on which day she was wont to receive singular graces. In her zeal for the conversion of souls she showed herself a true daughter of St. Dominic, and she was far from allowing either her blindness or her solitary life to interfere with her discharge of charitable offices to her neighbor. A small window opened from her cell, through which she received her daily portion of food, and communicated with those who sought her counsels. Uneducated as she was, she nevertheless spoke of divine things with such fluency, unction, and theological precision 
that she might have been supposed to be familiar with the soliloquies of St. Augustine and the meditations of St. Bernard. Great numbers of sinners were converted by her prayers and pious exhortations. Blessed Sibylina possessed a singular gift of spiritual discernment, and on one occasion warned a priest who was carrying the viaticum to the sick that the host he bore was not consecrated, which proved on inquiry to be the case. The sensible sweetness which she always felt in the nearness of the blessed sacrament served to warn her of the moment of consecration whenever a priest celebrated Mass in the church adjoining her cell, or bore the blessed sacrament past her window to the sick. This holy and afflicted servant of God departed to her spouse on Friday, March 19, 1367, being in the eightieth year of her age. Many extraordinary graces having been attained through her intercession, she was beatified by Pius the Ninth. Her body was found incorrupt when her tomb was opened in the year 1853. She is held in special veneration by servants, in consequence of a tradition that she had lived in domestic service, doubtless in her childhood, and a pious confraternity of servants is established in Pavia under her patronage. <laughs>